Because I remember when I decided to do cardiology, I had no confidence that I could be a cardiologist. Everybody in London seemed to be taller, <laughs> square of jaws, <laughs> deeper voices, and, and, uh, and I, I didn't believe I could, could do it, but, but I was prepared to take the risk. Then, then a few years later, um, I was actually registrar of the London Chess, I hadn't done too badly, and it came time to do research. And I could have stayed at the chest and picked up somebody else's project, it would have been easy. But I decided to join the aeronautics department in Imperial and to work with um, mathematicians on integrated physiology. No doctor had been there before. Why did I do that? It felt so uncomfortable at the time. It was so risky. Uh, and I didn't understand why I made that decision at the time. The, the knowledge I gained from my the research, the generic research skills have been invaluable as a clinical leader. So I think there's a huge synergy there. I think my time as a single-handed cardiologist in a town gave me a population perspective which others don't necessarily have when you've got sick or seven in a service. And I just think I've been developing all the time. Uh, without realising it, and it's been a bloody uncomfortable process. Um, but I think that's how I came to have these characteristics that others saw in me that I didn't see in myself not so long ago. So it's quite a personal story, um, but I think it makes sense to me now. So the health service, health and healthcare, has financial challenges. It does genuinely feel like austerity. We also have a population that is relatively dependent on the NHS. It loves the NHS. So dependent on it. As my current minister often says, people know that their lifestyle behaviours are bad for them, but they still do them. When the chickens come home to roost and they've got some problem, then their tendency is to bring it to the NHS and want to hand it over. And that's unacceptable in our view. We're going to have to think more, and it's politically difficult, but we're going to have to think more about how we can help people realise that they have to share the continuing responsibility for their own health. But there are reasons to be optimistic. We, we have um, urged uh, purchases of providers, so we have integrated organisations. We have a very strong set of values, which I think actually most people buy into, which are about collaboration, not competition. It's about a um, fair society. Um, it's about a national approach with consistent care and minimal postcode variation. I, th I think these are political principles which most of us, whatever our backgrounds, can probably buy into. Um, so, and, and we're trying to improve things through trust and altruism, the TNA approach. It's very different from targets and terror, the TNT approach. I think up to now, targets and terror perhaps appears on the face of it a little bit more successful, but people don't like it. <coughs> TNA, trust and altruism, you know, the old ethic of public service, I think, has strong support in the system. We've just really got to kind of make it work. I also feel that we've got a huge amount of activity in clinical leadership development, but those inputs aren't necessarily matched by the outputs. And we had a, a workshop today where we've got everybody in the room, and there's a huge amount going on. It feels like a very healthy culture. Um, but I think it's more about how to be a leader than what the leader is supposed to achieve. So I think we've got a bit of a gap in terms of the visionary statement about what we want of our clinical leaders, and by that I mean everybody. So we put it to work to do that, to, to work out what it is we want people to achieve in Wales. Um, we had colleagues from the NHS Leadership Academy who went through the leadership framework, and that was very helpful too, because that's based on behaviour, which I think we would all sign up to. And then what I suppose I realise is that it's up to us in Wales how we use that framework. And that's where the what comes in as well as the how. So I think we can make our clinical leadership development more effective with a higher kind of uh, value for money. And finally, the concept that um, I've been talking about in our table here, that comes from our minister. And we have a very, very smart uh, academic minister present, is the concept of prudent medicine. And it's all about essentially trying to provide um, a level of medical care or health care that is more appropriate to an individual's genuine situation in life. 
It's about re-emphasizing individual responsibility, not necessarily accepting all the responsibility ourselves, but supporting individuals and society to manage their own conditions. It's about shared decision-making, clinical pathways that don't seem to be designed simply to provide a huge number of patients at the expensive end. So I think we're going to be talking a lot more about what our minister calls prudent medicine. I think it's a, a model that Canada is called Parsimonious Medicine previously, but it may be our way out because it may help us manage within our resources while at the same time providing what individuals and society really need for their best personal outcomes.